So welcome everyone. I'm Sandra Crawford, the events manager at Alice, which is a free website that helps business owners find the right path to start and grow their companies. Alice at helloalice.com is open to all entrepreneurs and prioritizes access for women and other underrepresented business owners. And we are here today kicking off the first in a bi-weekly series of Office Hours with Lisa Wang, the founder and CEO of SheWorks. And these live virtual office hours are going to cover a variety of topics for business owners looking to start and grow their company. Alice is proud to co-host this event with Lisa Wang and PepsiCo as part of PepsiCo's Woman Made initiative to support female founders with peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, access to tools, um, relevant content, and expert guidance. For support in your business, join the Woman Made community on HelloAlice.com. Um, Lisa Wang, our host for these office hours, is a former U.S. national champion and Hall of Fame gymnast turned serial entrepreneur. She's the founder of SheWorks, the successful leading global platform empowering 20,000 women to build and scale successful companies through access to mentors and investors. Each week, Lisa will bring in a guest mentor to join her in facilitating the discussion and answering your questions. This week, this week we have Annie Case joining us, an investor at Kleiner Perkins, who focuses on investments in early stage companies. After today's lesson, we'll open it up to audience Q&A so you can get your business questions answered directly by the experts. So at any time during the discussion, please feel free to drop in questions using the Q&A function you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, Lisa and Annie, would you start us off with a little bit more about yourselves and what we'll be learning today? Yeah, so I'll kick us off. Welcome everyone to Live Office Hours. My name is Lisa Wang, and as Sandra already mentioned, I'm the founder of SheWorks. So I'm super excited to have everyone here who is now part of the community at Woman Made. And also very excited to have Annie here, who is an investor at Kleiner Perkins. Today we'll be talking about how to create your investor ready pitch and pitch deck. So just a quick um, bullet before we get started. If you see the chat function below, um, I just wanna see who's excited for today, where are people tuning in from? Um, you can write a line about your company. Um, but as I share the next things, would love to have people you know, insert some of their um, let us know where you're from. And also before we get started, just a quick thank you to PepsiCo for making these office hours possible and for Alice for hosting us. So this is going to be a really engaging and informative hour. Awesome, great to see Rachel from New York, Grace from San Francisco, um, Suzanne from New York, um, we've got bamboo toothbrushes and private packs, Becky from Houston, uh, great to see representation from so many cities. And um, as you hear interesting quotes or valuable nuggets of information um, from myself and from Annie, I highly encourage you to write it down. And for those of you who want to get even more engaged with the office hours, we are actually doing a challenge today. And I know all entrepreneurs love challenges. Um, Annie has graciously offered to give out one-on-one 15-minute -on -one sprint meetings to three lucky winners who can get her personal feedback on your deck or your fundraise. So if you want to partake in the challenge, it's just a few simple steps. Just head over to Instagram, um, follow PepsiCo, Lisa Wang wins, and Hello Alice. So those three handles. And if you create an Instagram quote card of the most interesting knowledge nugget or quote you hear today within 24 hours, then we will later this week announce who the winners are. So um, as we do the conversation today, please share your questions in the chat area and I'll get to them as many as possible. Um, so just quick note, seeing people, Melina from Twin Cities, Minnesota, Kim from New York, Sabria, and you are from Raleigh, North Carolina. Awesome, founder of Project Passport. Um, Nicole from LA in the blockchain space. Great to see representation from so many industries. So without further ado, Today we are joined by Annie. Annie Case joined Kleiner Perkins in 2018 and focuses on investments in early stage companies. Before that, she worked in product and business operation roles at Uber. And while at Uber, she supported the SVP of operations and helped scale Uber Eats, um, which I am a big fan of and use often. 
Um, she scaled that internationally and she started her career as a consultant at Bain and Company in San Francisco and graduated from Stanford University with a degree in human biology and master's in management science and engineering and um, also a fellow athlete as a member of the Stanford women's soccer team. Annie, so excited to have you here. Thank you so much for having me and uh, great to meet you all virtually. Um, the, thank you for, for giving the background on myself. Uh, you did my, my job for me, but as, uh, as Lisa said, I'm an investor at, at Kleiner Perkins. I joined last year from, from Uber and I spend most of my time investing in early stage uh, consumer and digital health companies. Uh, but our fund is a $600 million early stage fund. So we invest across seed, series A and series B um, and across industries as well. So I focus on consumer and digital health, but our fund looks at enterprise, fintech, hardware, uh, consumer kind of across the board. Um, so so great, to, great to meet you all. Awesome. So I'd love for you to tell the group just about your personal investment thesis. Like what, what do you look for and what gets you the most excited about companies that pitch you? Oh, that's a good question. I think um, for, for us at the early stage, so it's important to separate kind of the earliest stages and then more like growth, uh, growth investing because of the earliest stages, there tends to not be too much data to go off of. Um, so for me, the first thing that I look for and, and get really excited about is just a founder that I connect with. Um, and so that is just a founder um, that seems super passionate about the space that they're tackling, where it really makes sense why they are dedicating their, their time to this endeavor. Um, and they really know, um, have some kind of unique insight into the market that it feels like um, they have a great shot at building something really special. So, you know, there are obviously a lot of factors and we'll get into that as we talk more about what to, what to look for in a seed deck. But um, for me, it's really the personal relationship and the, you know, is this someone that I want to work with for the next five or 10 years? Because, you know, taking investors onto your board and uh, taking an investment is really a long-term partnership. So I try to make sure that it feels like a good person and someone that I want to spend my time with. Yeah. And could you talk more about what helps someone make that immediate personal connection with you if they only have, let's say, 30 minutes to make that impression? Yeah. Or even the first minute when they walk in? Yeah, I think some of it is just kind of getting the sense for the person of what, you know, what does, is this person um, confident? Do they do they seem like they really know the space that they're, they're tackling? Because in a lot of cases, in, in almost every case, actually, um, you as the founder know so much more about your space and industry than I do. And so part of it is, um, are you able to articulate your vision um, and, and why your, your product or your company matters in a way that is clear to someone who will never understand, you know, as much about your business as you do? Um, can you paint a really clear and articulate picture of what that looks like um, to make me feel like, you know, we're in, we're in, in, I'm in good hands, you know, like I can trust you to, to run off and, and execute on that vision because you know your stuff so well um, that, that, you know, I, I, I will never be able to, to compare to that level of expertise in, in the area that you're, that you're tackling. So just showing that you're um, poised and, and articulate and, um, and really know, know the area that you're going after. Not to say you have to have had 20 years of experience in that industry before, but just that it's well researched and um, you you understand why this is a problem we're solving. Definitely, and I think that's a great point in terms of a reminder for a lot of founders because um, coming in and asking for money can obviously be intimidating, especially for a first time founder, but remembering that you are the expert, right? And the investor is looking for people to educate them. Um, you know, as you mentioned, like you want to be challenged, you want to be educated and learn from someone else who's the expert. So, um, I think that's really a, something as a reminder to some of the women who are on this, on, on this forum. So um, great. So now that they've kind of made that great impression on you, um, can you walk through what someone should do? Should they jump into their deck right away? Um, or, you know, how, how should they really navigate that conversation? Yeah, I think it really depends on the, the context for the conversation. I think, you know, the, the majority of the pitches that I hear are, it's a meeting that's been, you know, pre-set up, either it got introduced through someone or I reached out directly and either they're you know, coming into the office for a 30 minute or 45 minute meeting, or you know, we have a phone call and all of those things do. You know, sometimes it's you, you find someone for five minutes in the corner of a conference and, and try to pitch them. So of course <clears throat> the like format in, impacts how you'd think about a pitch. 
Um, but for, for me, and I think one, what you'll ultimately try to do when you're raising money is get in front of investors kind of one-on-one -on -one for a longer period of time. So assuming that this is more of like the, you have 30 or more minutes, um, how, how to go about that. I do think, um, I sometimes see founders who like sit down, they're like, hi, I'm whoever, like, this is my company. And like, here's my presentation and flash it right up. And of course I, that, that is totally fine. And you're excited to get into the, the materials that you put together. You probably spent a ton of time on your deck. So um, I totally respect that. I do think because of what I said earlier, where it's so important to build a personal connection with the, with the investor that you'll work with, spending a little bit of time at the beginning, um, just talking can be really great. And sometimes, you know, you don't want it to feel awkward or forced, but just, you know, even simple things like, you know, the traffic coming down here was so bad. Like I had to drop my kids off at school and then, you know, just kind of humanizing you and giving uh, the investor the opportunity to do the same. Um, you can, you can learn not a ton about somebody in that short time, but I think it can help both the investor and the founder who's pitching feel a bit more at ease. And, you know, you realize like, wow, I'm actually talking to a real human being and it's not this um, awkward dynamic between an investor and a founder. So I think spending a, a little bit of time just kind of chatting can be helpful, but obviously you don't, if you only have 30 minutes, you don't want to waste 10 minutes um, talking small talk. So a, a balance for sure. But I, I like the kind of humanizing impact of having a minute or two of, of small talk before you get into it. Great. And so let's dive into the pitch deck itself. Um, what is it that venture investors are looking for in the pitch deck? What makes a good one and what makes a not so good one? Yeah, no, that's a, a great question. And of course, the deck will change as you progress through stages of the company as well. Like, of course, I think as you, if you looked at the average C versus A versus B deck, like you probably would see more slides as you get later. Um, partly that is, you have a lot more data to share. Um, but assuming this is for a seed deck, I always say simpler is better. Um, fewer slides is better. And it's really the story that matters more than like, do you have every single metric? Have you checked every box? Do you have, like, there's really no, what well, we can talk through a potential template and kind of what high level bucket should be included, but there's no like set checklist of things. And it really is simpler is better and, and stick to a story that feels authentic to you. Great. And what about the, the format itself? Um, you know, are, is there a typical number of pages? Um, what's kind of necessary information to include and not so necessary information? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can walk through kind of when I think about pitch decks, like what I typically see in, 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 in the flow that I often see, like kind of slide by slide, if that would be helpful. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Yeah. So the, the number of slides I think can change and is, is really like what area makes sense for you as a founder to go deeper. If you're saying, if you're doing work on a company in the healthcare space, you're probably going to have more slides or more coverage on the regulatory environment than if it is a direct to consumer product, um, because it's, that's just less relevant for that space. So the number of slides for each section, I think, um, will change a lot and you shouldn't feel like oh, I only have one slide to explain this like use whatever you need um, but in general the flow we see is you know obviously you start with the title page like this is our company I'm the CEO potentially these are my co-founders whoever's presenting with you um, and then um, what I love to see on that very next slide and people disagree on this and it depends on your company um, how important this is but I love when you just get right into the problem of like here's our company, this is the problem we're trying to solve at the very high level, whether that's great if you can quantify it in some way, but whether that's something like, you know, 70% of people have this issue or um, companies or companies or the government wastes X billions of dollars per year on blah, um, whatever it is, just a, a simple high level problem statement, I think can be really powerful. Um, and then the ne very next slide, I love that to be your introduction to your company of, and this is why we exist. Like this is our, it's the solution statement. This is, um, this is the way that our company will solve that problem. Like we exist to solve the problem that we just mentioned. Um, and that's where you have the opportunity to explain what your company does or will do. Um, and is in as few, <clears throat> in as few words as possible, like try to be very clear. We know it is multifaceted. You probably want to do 
a ton of things over time, but what is the crux of um, the problem you're trying to solve? <clears throat> so that should come next. Um, next, we often see tra a traction slide. If you, if you have it, of course, if you're just starting out, you may not, um, but that would be your opportunity to say, you know, already we're solving it for these people in this way. Um, and you know, if you have revenue, great, great slide to show revenue. Um, if you are not yet monetizing, that could be growth in your user base, um, or just something to say, um, you know, here's what we've accomplished so far is a great next slide. And this is where, if you've been around longer, you could take three or four slides and say, here's revenue, here's engagement, here's, you know, a, a bunch of different metrics, but kind of whatever you have. Um, and then next we often see uh, differentiation so how, why you're why you're different than your competitors so that could be either competitor landscape um, or um, some some explanation of what drives the traction that you've gotten so far um, can can be a great one or what's your unique insight that uh, your competitors can't replicate that could be your founder experience like this is my experience what i've done before that makes me best positioned to solve this problem um, or or something else uh, but that tends to be an important slide to see and people will, whether you have that or not, at, probably as a follow-up say, like, what else is going on in this space? You know, who do you think of as your competitors? Um, and then the, I, I guess we could take a break there if there are any, any questions or kind of halfway through. I think typically it's about 10 slides, um, but I can, you know, dive into the, the next flow as well if that would be helpful. Yeah. Um so I think that a lot of the companies that we see today um, and are probably approaching you are at that stage where they're pre-revenue when it comes to traction. Maybe they haven't yet launched. Um, they are at that product stage where they um, you know, pre-launch, maybe no recurring users yet. How do they actually convey some sort of traction when they you know, have little of it? Yeah, and I think we, so a lot of people are like, oh, I don't have revenue yet. Like, what do I, what do I say? Um, I think there's a ton that you can do to be creative to show that there is demand for your product. So even like a lot of, a lot of companies that are pre-product, pre-launch, you, you're like, I have nothing, you know, often in later stage or for, for us, like series A, series B, part of the pitch is like, let's walk through a demo, like show us your product. And you could be saying, I haven't built it yet. Like, I have no idea. Um, I can't do that. And so just anything you can do to get at um, to show people will care about this. Like if we build it, people will care because this is solving a real problem. So I've seen people do that really creatively through surveys, either through kind of there are, there's academic literature on this. These other people did this longitudinal study that showed this um, to show. Uh, but, but I think it's really cool when you as the founder find a scrappy way to, to either get an, an initial pilot users to interview them and say, you know, how much would you pay for this kind of just some user research to say, yeah, we don't have traction yet, but we have a lot of people saying that they're really excited for us to go build this product. Um, and that this is a real need for them because they're not seeing it solved otherwise in the market. Got it. And what about unit economics? Is that important early on? It depends. Um, I think there are obviously a lot of companies, you know, I came from Uber where um, our unit economics continue to be upside down in, in some, some places. So obviously it can, it can work. Um, but I think depends, depends a bit on your, your business and what's more important than current state, what your unit economics look like um, pre-launch or, you know, day one is how do you envision that changing over time? Like if it's something where the unit economics actually look pretty, pretty bad at a small scale, how can you tell the story around like, as we scale, this will improve dramatically and, and make that really believable. Uh, because while there's some things you and the founder can do to make the unit economics look a little bit better than it might be today, it actually doesn't serve you well to over pretend um, and, and get investors involved with that promise because then you're kind of on the hook to live up to that and say, you know, we, we think we can, gross margins will be 10% today, but we think we can get it to 70. And you're like, okay, how? Um, and if you, if it looks like that story is not believable, um, then you could lose some credibility as a founder. So I think it's being really honest about, here's what the reality is today. Here are the things that I think I can control over in, in the future to, to influence that. And then here's where I think it can get to. And hopefully that is a place that is sustainable. 
Yeah. So what I'm hearing is it's really about the importance of story when it comes to your numbers, when it comes to your traction. And another thing that is um, a question that I get asked a lot is what is the, what is the balance between being ambitious and confident in projections that don't exist today versus realistic? And um, do you see a difference when it comes to gender? Yeah, I had a feeling I knew where you were going with this, and I absolutely do. And I wish I could say that I didn't, but it definitely feels, it feels very real. Um, and not to say, you know, anyone is lying or misrepresenting the truth or whatever, but I do, f I have found in my, the pitches that I've seen that it is more common for men to say, this is where we are today. And I am like, watch me, watch me get to this place. Like, I know that we will get here to this improvement. Um, and I think women are more cautious and as you would say, realistic, like being honest and I wanna be open and honest and transparent. And I think that comes, tends to come more naturally um, and can lead to a feeling of, oh, like, is she not, is she not confident or, and this, it happens across both genders for sure. But, but as a general theme, um, I think it is less common for women to say, this is what it looks like today, but like, give me three years and this will, will have made all of this progress. Um, or, you know, even talking about whether it's unit economics or market size or whatever, I think um, women could do well to be a little bit more, to give themselves more credit and say, like, I'm going to, I will figure this out because um, a lot of your male peers are doing that. Yeah. Um, what are some example, let's, let's start with pitch decks first in terms of someone who sent you a pitch deck um, that you opened it and what made you want to meet with the founder and um, ending with some tactical advice that entrepreneurs can, can utilize when they want to reach out to an investor and only have a few bullet points in the deck. Yeah, for sure. I think, like I said before, the most important thing is to just be um, very clear and, and keep it simple. Because as you said, when you, if you're getting a blurb or a, a quick look at a pitch deck, um, the real thing you're hoping to do with that is get a meeting and get in front of the, the person. Like you're never going to be able to, to tell the whole story or whatever in an email. So don't try to. I've also gotten some cold emails that are five page pitches, just like text. And um, that's not a recipe for success either, regardless of what that text says. I think it says for us, it's hard to not read into that signal of, um, you couldn't boil it down to this is the problem and this is our solution and this is why I'm the right person to build it. Um, so I think just being as succinct and, and clear as possible is what I look for, like clarity of thought. And then, you know, if you're attaching a deck and you want us to look, look at the deck, I'll click into it and kind of look for those high level buckets of, is it super clear within 30 seconds, like what the problem is and how you're going to solve it. Um, and if sometimes, um, we'll see something where I'm like, oh, that's a big, pro that does sound like a big problem. And um, you do, do seem credible in this space, but it's, it's really just not a market that we've um, gotten excited about in the past or um, have, have a ton of knowledge about like, and then it requires kind of an extra push to say, like, can you articulate why this space is even interesting? Um, if it's something that we may have written off previously, which of course isn't on you, the founder to, know what every investor is excited about and what they're not. But I think going a bit further to say, like, you know, if I know that like ad tech is not super hot with VCs right now, um, why is my ad tech platform different or something like that? Um, but depends, of course, on, on what your market is. Great. And so what I'm hearing then is really just about simplicity, clarity, and being concise. Um, because what, what, I think one of the mistakes a lot of founders make is they have so much information as an expert in their field that they end up going perhaps too granular into some of the details and um, trying to fit way too much on the deck. And um, so I think the lesson for everyone here is um, almost less words and the more concise you can make it, the more clear you can make it, if you can fit it into one line, one sentence, um, that's how you know you have uh, the winning formula for capturing attention, at least initially. Yeah, it really is like, pretend that you're explaining it to a fifth grader or something. And then, you know, of course, depending on what you're building, if it's something deep in the infrastructure world, presumably you're talking to an investor that specializes there and you can be more technical. Um, but I think in a lot of cases, the, the advice to 
dumb it down and simplify um, and, and up level as much as you can with that initial, like the words on the slide and then um, speak to it more in detail when you're um, in, in front of the person it tends to work well. Cool. Um, so I'm going to ask a few more questions and I want to, um, for all of the people, looks like we have around um, 50 people because we also have some people on Facebook who are tuning in live. Um, if you have any questions for those who are on the Zoom, just type them in the Q&A section and then we will be able to get to them. Um, so Annie, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see founders make in their deck? Um, I think that all ties back to some of the things that I've already said, which is going into way, way too much detail too quickly, um, or I will, I'll have seed decks that I'll look at and it immediately is just, here is the like AI ML application of this software and how, and you're just like, whoa, like let's All step <laughs> you know, like AI ML, incredible, love it. But like, first tell me like what, what the market is here, like where, wh what the problem is that you're trying to solve and then why like AI and ML is like even the right solution for that problem. Um, because I think a lot of particularly technical founders can get super excited about the um, technical problem that they're solving and the way that like the, the actual solution and say like we our tech is incredible and you're like okay but what is it incredible for um, why 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 does this need to exist um, and so I think making sure that you're you're staying at a high enough level early on um, and and sticking with problem solution rather than look at all of the cool stuff that I can build or I've already built. Um, that that's one mistake. I think another is um, this depends on who you're pitching to and, and how it goes as well. But I think it's important to remember that you are um, we're, be, we're evaluating you not just on your deck, but you as a person and how you carry yourself and um, and so forth. And you know we've had pitches where we've had full uh, pitches in front of our full investment committee where the founder is presenting on his or her laptop and like their email notifications are like popping up throughout the, the session. Mm -hmm. And that just feels like, it's not the end of the world. Like people make mistakes, but it feels a little unprofessional. And then you wonder like, what else is this person um, forgetting to do? Or is this person like, does this person pay attention to the details and detail oriented? Because we don't have that many signals to evaluate you on. And so um, little things like that end up mattering. So I think, um, it's important to, to be thoughtful about the way that you come off, uh, to people, um, even in, in subtle ways. Yeah. Um, I want to reiterate that, um, that everything you do is a signal, um, and little things matter, especially when you're given, um, limited touch points of interaction. And I think that's an interesting point about those email notifications or, you know, taking notes on your phone or like, you know, Twittering, tweeting on your phone and, um, so I think that, uh, yeah, keeping track of those things that you're doing, the way you're presenting yourself, the confidence which you walk into the room and ultimately that you are the package, um, you're the, the embodiment of the company. So think about how you're presented, um, and how that reflects upon whether you do have an investable company. And by the way, that should be something that you're doing with the investors that you're meeting with too, because I found, um, I've met with other investors before where, and seen them checking their phones during meetings or, or whatever. And I think as a founder, I would look at that and say, wow, is this person really engaged? Is this person, does this person care? Like, of course, maybe they're really busy. Something just happened. They have kids and whatnot. Like you never know what, what someone's going through. But I think um, as a founder, when you're pitching people also pay attention to how the investor is behaving because you, you know, you, it's, you've earned the right to have people who, you also respect and admire and, and will treat you well. And so um, pay attention to those things for the investors you pitch to. Definitely. I actually, I've, I've experienced that before and um, immediately knew it was the wrong fit. <laughs> exactly. You're like, we have 30 minutes together. If you're going to spend five of them on your phone, like let me go somewhere else. Yeah, exactly. Um, cool. So um, I know we have a question from Melissa Shia and she says, when sending a pitch deck to a potential investor, how much financial information should you include? What should you wait to share until you get to the meeting? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I, so I've talked to a lot of founders about this who are like, I don't want to just include in my deck 
all of my information, just, you know, when I send it for, for a first meeting and then have them say no and just know that, you know, maybe they're forwarding the deck or, or whatever and that that information's um, getting out there. But for me as an investor, I find it frustrating when I receive a deck from someone and they're like, you know, here's, here's our business, here's how much we're raising, like, let me know if you want to meet. And I'm like, but you didn't tell me some very critical information about your company that would, would determine whether I'm interested in meeting or not. You know, if you're saying you're a retail brand, you've been around for four years and you did $500 of sales last month, like it's probably not going to be a fit for us. Like I would love to be able to support you, but none of us have endless time. And um, if I, if I just knew that revenue number was not going to hit the bar for us, I could have saved both of us the time and said, this isn't going to be a fit. So I do think it's important to, um, you know, you can of course withhold, like it's, it's common for us to see, you know, you will have revenue information and, and general financials, but you won't in that initial deck include your full customer list or your current sales pipeline or whatever those things. I think it's fine to come later. Um, but I, I think it's tough if you have revenue um, and and other metrics to share to not to not include that stuff up front. Yeah, and so this I think goes to the, another question which we had submitted um, that said I've talked to several entrepreneurs who wonder about NDAs and making sure an investor won't steal your idea when you pitch them. Um, what advice do you have in this area? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we we hear a lot. Uh, I've gotten a lot of questions about this in the past, and I I think it's. It's funny because it's not funny. It's, you know, I totally respect the desire to keep your, your stuff confidential. But I think as an early stage investor, um, we wouldn't, we would cease to exist as a fund if we were, if we were doing that, you know, if we said, oh, I got pitched by Lisa and then I thought it was a great idea. So the next day I left Kleiner Perkins and created that company. It's like that would come out and it would be very obvious um, that, that you were in the wrong. Um, so like that, from that perspective, it's like, I, it makes sense as a founder that you want to be cautious, but I don't think you need to be, um, too concerned about that because it is our job to treat founders well and to um, like our, our, our reputation matters so much in this industry that, um, you, you wouldn't survive in this industry if you were doing stuff like that. Um, traditionally we see on the growth side. So, you know, series C, series D and beyond, NDAs are fairly common because at that point you have so much operating history, you have full customer list, you have a full data room that you're giving access to um, and you will go super deep on if you're excited about an investment. So it's common to sign an NDA at that stage. I have never, for the early stage investments that I look at, signed an NDA. Um, that's just not really part of the, the culture of venture investing at this stage. Uh, I've been asked a few times and we've said, you know, happy to sign an NDA, you know, down, down the line if, if you really want one, but like here, you know, we typically don't at this stage. So, and I haven't, I haven't needed to for, for any of the investments that we've done. Um, so I would say, don't worry about asking for that or feeling like you need that at the earliest stages. Yeah. Especially because at, at the earliest stage, it's really, you know, it's, it's not, that it's not about the idea, but a lot of times it's, it's about, it's not about the idea. It's actually about the execution. <laughs> Exactly. For sure. And the number of people who have said, oh, well, like I, I had the idea for Uber, right? Yeah. <laughs> <Good luck>. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. No, for sure. And, and at the growth stage, it's not that people, it's not that you're signing the NDA because you're thinking about going to steal the idea of this company that's been around for six years and doing, you know, tens of millions of dollars in revenue. At that point, it's like, it makes sense to have an NDA because you're concerned about your data getting shared with a competitive party because the, the stakes are so high at that stage. At the earlier stage, the attitude tends to be go build something of a value before you get concerned about someone stealing it. Cause often it's like you, you haven't, you haven't done that yet. You know, you don't have a, and especially at C, like you haven't built a, a business that someone wants to steal yet. <laughs> um, so I think not being overly concerned about that at the earliest stages makes sense. Great. Uh, question from Becky Holmes who said, could Annie finish going over the slides to include, we got to differentiation. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't want to just go on for too long, but yes, I'm 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 happy to um, if that if that works for you all. So, um, I was saying there typically are ten slides. I think we've gotten through through five of them. So it was title, problem statement, solution statement, traction, differentiation. That was kind of the first half. And of course, for any of those, you can have more slides if it makes sense. Um, the next one after differentiation tends to be business model. 
So, you know, how are you making money um, or how will you make money if you haven't quite nailed down the business model yet? A lot of seed companies, um, particularly on the like consumer social side are, are not focused on revenue at the moment. They're saying we just want to get users. And so talking about how you may monetize down the line, whether that's through advertising or upselling products or, or a premium offering um, depends on consumer versus enterprise and, and what have you. But a slide on how will this company make money, um, whether it's now or at some point is super important. And then, you know, pricing and tiers of pricing and, and all of that is, is important there if it's an enterprise company. And then the next slide tends to be the market, um, market sizing. Uh, what is this market? Is it going to be big? Um, are you going to be able to capture a meaningful portion of it and why? Um, and that's kind of to solve the question for the investor of like, what, what do I need to believe to think that this can become a really big company? Um, Cause that's what we're, we're betting on. Um, and so knowing that you're tackling a large enough market that you could conceivably build a big company um, is really important. And that's one that some, some pitches you'll see that like one of the first slides, if not the first slide where they're saying like, we're tackling this massive market. Um, it doesn't, for all of these, it doesn't really matter exactly which one comes when, but I think hitting all these buckets it, is important. Um, and then after the market, we typically see a team slide. So, you know, this is me, you're meeting me, I'm the founder. If you're pitching with your co-founder, like this is my co-founder, you know, we have another, a third co-founder who's not here today, he or she, like this is their background. Um, and, you know, depending on at seed, it's often you, maybe your co-founder, maybe another co-founder, and you may not have a, any of their employees, but that's where you'd have the opportunity to say, there are nine people on our team. Three of them are developers. We outsource to Croatia. Like we have a salesperson in LA or, um, and just talking about who you have on the team and why, are, why they're the most kick-ass team in the world to be talking, to be tackling this problem. Um, so that's, you know, talking about, you've already talked about your own background in this space, uh, presumably, but giving um, reasons to believe in your co-founders as well and at that stage. And then uh, next is the fundraise. So how much money you're asking for and uh, what you're hoping to do with it. So at C, that could be, we are looking to raise a million dollars to help us get this product to market, or we want to raise two and a half million dollars to invest in an engineering team and go to market. Um, and, or, or, you know, whether you don't often need super specific milestones, particularly at seed, um, but to say why you think that's the right amount and um, what you're hoping to do with it is, is important. Um, and that's the last kind of required slide after that. It's really like, if you have a whatever for your company you think you need to dive more in, you have an opportunity to do that. Whether it's, you know, you have a really complex product that you've already built, so you wanna do like a demo or a couple screenshots or, or whatever, um, there, feel free to, to add in whatever you want, but that tends to be the kind of main nine or so things to include. Great, and uh, following up on that, Sabria Dobbins wanted to know on the fundraise slide, um, when you say you do need X amount, um, let's say X amount for marketing costs, do you have to break that down into very granular parts or is it just high level what you're going to do with it and what you're gonna achieve? High level tends to be totally fine. I mean, I think you should be prepared for a question. Like, um, I think the question you'd get would be less like, oh, you said you need 400K for marketing. And like, let's, let's like talk about exactly what the plan is for the next six months of how you're gonna spend that. I think the question would be more like, oh, you say you need $2 million and that's for marketing and sales you haven't talked at all about like, this is a technical product and you haven't talked at all about hiring a technical team. Like how, what's your plan on that front? So it'd be more like if something doesn't really make sense of, it sounds like you're going to need some engineers, but you didn't really talk about that. Um, so just showing that you've thought about it um, and have a, a decent sense uh, tends to be sufficient versus the, you know, detailed financial model. And let's be honest, like you don't exactly know where each dollar will go yet. Yeah, definitely. Um, Larry Simmons wanted to know, can you mention large companies in a pitch deck that have given a verbal commitment to partner with you, but perhaps haven't signed anything? Yeah, I think that's up to you. Totally. I mean, one is up to the, with, with the company, you may want to ask per, for permission to say, um, do you mind if I mention you in, in my deck? Like that's not required. Uh, but I think it would be good, a good practice. The only I think in general, that can be helpful to say, you know, we've signed three contracts, we have five that are uh, pending or verbal, verbal commitments or what have you. I think the upside of that is you're saying like, we have a really big customer that's excited about us. 
The downside of that is if it's not signed yet, there's a chance that it'll fall through and going to your investors on and having them be excited and going to you know their team saying, I think we should invest in that company. They already have these big companies like X, Y, and Z excited about them. Um, and then a week later, you say, actually, that fell through. Um, that could actually do more harm than good because then the question is, why did they churn or why did they not end up following through? Like what, what happened? Um, so I would say if you think you're confident that, that it's going to happen and it's just a matter of, you know, haven't gotten through the final legal process yet, uh, feel free to mention it. Um, and you do want to share that you've had interest from those types of folks, but uh, don't overpromise because that could come back to bite you. Great. Um, and let's see, we have another question from anonymous attendee. If a founder has more granular slides in an appendix that they could attach in an email sending along their main deck, do you like to see them attached with the main deck in that first email exchange or prefer that they come later in the process? I think whatever, whatever works for you is fine there. I think you could start by saying, you know, here's my, it depends if you've met with them before too. And, but you could say here, you know, here's my deck, like very clear. Um, let me know if you want to talk more and then they could follow up and say, yeah, this looks interesting. Like send me more information that you have. Cause then you can, it's almost getting an early signal on how interested they are. Um, but if it's something where like, I've also gotten it saying, you know, for healthcare companies, because they tend to be more complicated, it's here's our deck, like our story, like typical, what you'd see across industries. And then, you know, here is more detail on the FDA approval process or we're almost through or, or whatever it is. Um, so that's totally up to your discretion. I don't think you would like, we would have made this investment if only you'd sent your appendix sooner. Um, but it's, but it's up to you. Great. Um, so we have a few questions in terms of outreach and finding investors. Christine Tang wanted to know, does cold reach out actually work? Can you talk about the balance between trying to get warm intros or what to do if you don't have any of those leads? Yeah, no, it's a super interesting one because a lot of really great investors disagree deeply on this. I think there are some funds that will put on their website, like, don't bother reaching out to us if it's a cold, if it's cold inbound, like we're not going to respond. Like part of it is like, it's a, like, find your way to us to prove that you're going to be successful. I think that's ridiculous um, and that good ideas come from all over and you shouldn't need to have gone to Stanford or Harvard or, or know somebody who's, you know, a big deal in Silicon Valley to be able to have a conversation. Um, so I personally am more, more open to, to cold inbound. That said, I mentioned earlier, you know, the example of a cold email that was a million pages long and that didn't end, end well for that founder. But I think if you are thoughtful about it and um, that like, if you're going to reach out to someone cold, it's on you to um, find other reasons to connect. So that could be, I've gotten reached out to on, on LinkedIn saying, you know, we haven't met, I don't know anyone that, that knows you, but I saw that you made this investment in this company. Um, I love that company. I, you know, I, like we're doing that kind of thing, but in this different industry, I think it's something you'd really like. Do you have 10 minutes to chat? Or, you know, can I send you my deck? And then I'll, you know, respond saying like, yeah, sure. Here's my email. Like, would love to look at your deck. So I think it depends. I don't think you should say cold inbound will never work. Um, of course, it tends to be better if you can get an intro, but um, but I, 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 I'd encourage it and say, you know, be scrappy and try to get the relationships you think you need to be successful. Awesome. Um, Sabria so Dobbins wanted to know about accelerators and pitch competitions and um, are they the best way to start to find investors? What are your thoughts on different accelerators? Yeah, um, I think it depends. I think it depends on your company and and where you are in your founder journey. I think um, for some for some companies, it it doesn't make sense. You already have what you think is an all star team. You have relationships that you think will will get you the funding that you need, um, and it just feels like you don't need to go through a rigorous program where you, in many cases, give up um, meaningful equity to as a price for going through the program. Um, in other cases, it can be hugely valuable. Um, I think for founders who are coming from, you know, outside, are outside of Silicon Valley and finding, you know, an accelerator in Silicon Valley that is their reason for, for being here um, can be helpful for the network that you can build. But even out, outside of, um, outside of there, if you are starting a company in Ohio and you don't know any founders in Ohio, then joining the, you know, the best known 
Ohio Accelerator where you can meet other founders in your same state um, and share stories and, and have a peer group um, and find talent that way and get yourself out there, I think can be really helpful. Um, so I think it's helpful as from a networking perspective, from kind of getting the word out about your company, um, but just be cautious about um, if it's a, if it's an accelerator, you think, you know, if the partners are really involved, will they be helpful? And then does it feel like a financial deal that you're comfortable with? Because I've met people who felt like they didn't realize what they were signing up for. Oh, like 6% of my company didn't feel like a big deal until I started building a big company. And then, you know, that was min millions of dollars that this accelerator got um, for, you know, eight weeks of, of help. So depends on your, your individual case, but I think they can be really helpful uh, for networking and, and practicing your pitch and, and all that. Yeah, great. Um, and the question that I'm seeing right now in terms of, uh, so Alexandra Fennell says, it seems increasingly difficult to find funds that really will write that first pre-launch check in the consumer space. Can you speak to this a bit and maybe offer some advice around this dynamic? Interesting. Yeah. So I spend less of my time on the super earliest stages, the kind of angel, like first check-in. Uh, typically we'll see companies that have either raised a friend and family round or, you know, raise a few million dollars um, and, and want to raise an A or uh, have raised like 500K and are now doing a bigger seed. Um, so it's rare that we are looking at the like actual first dollar into your company. So I can't speak to that in too much detail, but I, um, I do think it can be hard in consumer because you know so many companies fail and there's uh, especially with consumer products it can be hard to differentiate so um i think you know that's where it gets to being super super clear about why your product and your company is different um and then there are some great angel networks that can be that can help you instead of saying i've wasted two months just trying to get that first 25k in the door um, meeting one-off investors there are um, angel groups that you can um, kind of apply to pitch in front of where you could at least get in front of 50 angels at one time and say this is what we're building and um, and try to kind of expedite the process that way um, but but that 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 phase can be a, a tough one yeah yeah um, and I think this this goes straight to the question similarly from Kim Tai um, who asked about tips to identify the right fund and investor um, and how much outreach you should expect to do in seed rounds? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I've had founder friends who've done, done this in a, a number of ways. I think there's um, what one, the first step I think should be thinking about, you know, which, which funds you think could be a good fit for you, whether that's because you know, they're, they have, they focus on the segment, you know, the sector that you're working on, or, you know, that they have a partner who does uh, for, for funds that focus on a lot of areas and then kind of reading about some of the partners, seeing what, presumably if you're in this industry, you've, um, you know, either follow people on Twitter or you've gotten a sense of like, oh, these people are really active in this space or um, seeing what companies you admire in the space, go look at who their investors are and say like, oh, they seem active in, in this uh, in this space, so they'll be on my list and put together your list um, and include with that like first column is like the fund, second column is like person at that fund if you if you know of anyone, and then third would be do I know anyone at that fund? And it's okay if you're like I don't know anyone at any of these. That's where you know cold cold outreach could be important, or going on LinkedIn and seeing if you have any mutual connections could be important. Uh, but just getting a sense of who in this in this massive world of funds because there are so many of them now feels like they could be the right fit for me um, and then starting to find inroads to to those groups yeah i think that's a really important point that this question brings up in that um, i meet a lot of entrepreneurs who have come up to me and say i need to meet investors for my company can you introduce me to your investor network and <laughs> what what that shows is in many ways lack of preparation. Um, it does indicate uh, to that the person, um, like to someone like me, that it's a lack of respect of my time, um, you know, to kind of spray and pray. And if you are the person leading the company that if you're looking for funding, you haven't even taken the time to identify the specific funds or the specific individuals that you're looking to re reach out to. Um, so I, I do want to emphasize that point of how important it is to 
um, not only do research on your own product, of course, in terms of the company you're building, um, but also to do the research on what's the best fit for your company, because the reality is not all money is made equal. And um, especially not for, you know, everyone's, it's not the same for everybody. For sure. Uh, um, and that yeah. helps you also when you do end up getting a conversation with those people, because I've had people come and pitch me and I, you know, part of what I'll ask when they get to like the fundraise side is like, yeah, like, how are you, you know, what's the timeline for your fundraise? Like, how are you thinking about the partner that you want to bring on board? Because for us, it's often the Series A where, you know, they're thinking about creating a, a board. So I'm like, how are you thinking about like who you want as a board member? And I'm like, oh, like, we're really excited about you and, and Kleiner Perkins because, you know, we know you've just done so many incredible investments and long history of great investments in the like direct to consumer space. And, and I'm like, we actually heaven like we have <laughs> actually have invested in that series very little and that's not to say we won't and that we don't want to but it shows that you haven't done research on where our fund is invested um and where i've personally invested to to i'm like you must just be saying that to every investor because it's actually not true um and so make sure that you're doing your homework so that you can have conversations about like what do what do people actually bring to the table mm -hmm. yeah cool um another follow-up question about the deck from Kim says, can you talk more about the market size slide and what you look for in terms of the plan for market acquisition? Yeah, I think so, especially at CE, the market size slide should be very high level. Um, I think, you know, this is where a lot of investors say like, you want to be going after like multi-billion dollar markets. Um, and this is your opportunity to say like, we're doing that and, and here's why. Um, and so I, I think the best market size slides tend to be ones that just show like, based on industry data, which you, you know, cite at the bottom or have the link to at the bottom, like this, you know, this firm, research firm said that like US spend on X, Y, and Z is this today and will grow to this in, over the next five years. We think this portion of that is addressable um, and that we, you know, we think that we can, because of our way into the market, capture 10% of that or whatever, just like very, very high level ball, ballpark numbers um, is better, but um, but make sure that they're well researched and somewhat believable. I've also seen market size slides that are like, this is a $300 trillion industry. And you're like, you're obviously not gonna capture that. And so like, let's be realistic about what's in there and and how we can get that to, to yeah. a meaningful number. Yeah, definitely. Um, so kind of speaking to that vision, um, Susan Hosking asked, shouldn't the focus be more on selling the vision and transforming them to a place rather than providing granularity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I hopefully have not given the impression at all that I, I think granularity is, um, is what you should be focused on here. I think the way that you structure the kind of problem statement and then solution statement slides, like the solution is really a vision. It is like, we think we can solve this and, and take you to this place, this future state where this problem doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so whether you phrase it as a, like, here's our solution, or a, this is our vision for the future world we want you to live in, um, I think that's kind of your opportunity to say, uh, we we believe in a, in a different, better world, and here's how. Um, but yeah, very high level, certainly not not too granular, um, and, and make sure you have a compelling story around around your vision. I think that's a good point. Awesome. Um, so we have about five minutes left and I just want to dig in a bit more into you um, because you mentioned kind of that personal connection. So, you know, letting people know who is Annie behind the uh, investor. So um, I'd love to just hear from you in terms of your views of the future. You know, what gets you the most excited? Um, what issue is dearest to your heart? Yeah, no, that's a great, a great question. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that two of the areas that I spend time on are consumer investing broadly and then um, in, in healthcare and digital health. I think one area that I am super passionate about um, and am excited to have recently invested in is in the mental health space. I think that's just been a massive, massive problem and, and <clears throat> underserved market for a really long time. And I think you're seeing a lot of trends around that starting to change now where, um, you know, the it's becoming increasingly destigmatized. People, more people are talking about it. You're seeing it more, come up more in the news. Um, and I think it's been great to see how many 
founders have have taken that head on and said we want to build solutions whether that's consumer solutions uh, or selling through employers like the one that we invested in um, it's been really heartening for me to see all of the activity around mental health separate from that um, you and I are both uh, former athletes um, I'm super excited about a lot of changes in physical health um, and and fitness and opportunities there so we also recently made an investment in a company called Future that is helping to bring to kind of democratize access to personal trainers. And God, I'm I'm a user of Future. I'm an avid user of Future, and I've already recommended two friends who got my referral fee. Amazing! So got my, my Apple Watch from Future. <laughs> ah, I love it. The the downside of it that I would acknowledge today is that it does still feel expensive. Yeah. Um, it's very cheap compared to a personal trainer but it is still a higher end product. Um, and so that's something that I think is an opportunity to think about for them to think about how they can, um, you know, bring that down market more and, and make it more accessible for folks. But I think the solution that they built is really powerful um, and that it can have a lot of positive impact on people's lives. Um, so mental health, physical health are two areas that I have been excited about. I would like to spend more time um, and have spent a fair amount of time in the elder care market. I think that's another really underserved um, part of the population. Um, and, and education, I think, is also an area that, that needs a lot of help. Um, so I've spent some time in both of those markets, but you know, I, I do cover a lot. And so my ability to be incredibly thesis-driven and say I will focus um, and meet all of the companies in one space um, has been challenging. But those are some areas that I'm excited about because I think they can really move the needle for, uh, for our country and hopefully the world. Yeah. So you obviously encounter a lot of talented founders and investors and just people in general. What do you think is the difference between being good and being great? Ooh, as, a, as an investor or as a founder or as anyone? As anyone. I think the most important thing is to be authentic um, and, and honest with yourself about uh, what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because I think the happiest people that I, that I work with and, um, and are successful are people who uh, feel like they're in in whatever they're doing for the right reasons and it feels authentic to themselves and this is particularly true for founders where um, if you don't care about the the problem that you're solving um, you will fail like it is very hard to build a company and so it's super important for you to say like this is something that I deeply believe needs to exist in the world and I think that's true for investors as well I think investors who are just like oh, I want to make a bunch of money is like you're not going to be great because you won't be able to connect with founders in the same way. Um, you won't have a, an, an interesting point of view on the types of things you want to invest in um, because I think it's really important to, to win the right deals in the right markets. You need to deeply understand and care about the, the segments that you're looking at. So I think it really is just passion and authenticity. Yeah, definitely. Um, and when it comes to a, a takeaway, a book that someone, you know, from this could read, whether to learn more about the way you view the world or just a book that you recommend in terms of tactical um, reading that founders should do, uh, what would you recommend and why? Ooh, there's, you know what, there is no shortage of business books available and I have read many of them. I actually think the best way to, for me to consume uh, business books is actually through podcasts. I think it is really great at getting people who've written 400 page books to distill their learnings down into like 30 or 40 minutes. Um, so I love that. So I t typically read those types of books via podcast and, and prefer that. A book that I read recently that I think is awesome and maybe not what I should be recommended to, to founders who need to work really hard, but is uh, Why We Sleep. I don't know if any of you all have read it, but um, the science behind sleep, that's another area that I'm excited about. Actually, any founders working on that space, uh, please reach out. But um, I think the evidence suggesting how important sleep is to to our existence um, and the impacts that it has on health and wellness and well-being um, is, is remarkable. Um, so that's, I, I think, a really great read. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's something I've learned too. It's even, I try to get seven to eight hours of sleep every night because it makes me a better entrepreneur. It makes me a better friend. It makes me a better human being in general. And there's a great um, metaphor that I heard recently that human beings are basically plants. We just, plants with emotions. <laughs> we need water, sunlight, nutrients, and, you know, ultimately just way to recover yeah. and thrive. Um, awesome. So we are at the top of the hour and I want to thank you so much for taking the time today to share your knowledge. Um, as a reminder for everyone, if you do want a chance to talk directly with Annie and get feedback, um, the challenge, uh, I believe is also written in the chat box where, 
um, follow the three Instagram handles and um, a, just create a graphic from a quotable quote that you learned today. And we will be announcing those winners and introducing you to Annie. So I believe is team Alice coming back on to. Yes. <laughs> Hi, thank you both so, so much for joining us and sharing all this wonderful wisdom. It's, it's been amazing. Um, I wanted to let everyone know that Lisa will be back next week on June 27th um, for the next uh, office hours. And I'm posting that in a link to the chat right now. Um, so you can sign up there. And then uh, we'll be sharing this recording in the Women Made community on Alice. So if you haven't yet joined that, go to helloalice.com and join the Women Made community. Um, it's got resources, advice, uh, connections with expert mentors for you to grow your business. Awesome. Thanks so much, everyone. Great to meet you all. Have a good one. Bye, everybody. Thank you.